So Ryan St. Clair is going to be the next uh, presenter, and he's going to be presenting on uh, spe spectral investigation of well-known partial differential equations discret discretized by finite differences. So whenever you're ready, Ryan. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is uh, a research project that was, that was kind of in the same vein as uh, the other one we've been hearing today. I think this one was, was kind of a little bit of a precursor to Emma's. Uh, you just heard some of the continuing work after this. Uh, but this is this is a project I did last spring um, for my for my senior thesis um, under the supervision of, of Dr. Ozer. It was on a special investigation of, of well-known partial differential, partial differential equations discussed by finite differences. In particular, we were, we were looking at the wave equation. Um, and uh, DJ went over this a little bit. I, I, my professor, anyone who, who, uh, who's new here, um, some, some kind of potential applications of this research um, is related to piezoelectric devices and kind of smart materials. And piezoelectric devices are, are materials that uh, they have a relationship between kind of like applied stress and, and electric potential. And so you can you can kind of bend them or apply some stress to them, and they'll generate an electric potential. But then also, if you if you apply a potential to them, then then they they'll bend or make some mechanical movement as well. And so there's there's a lot of potential uses from kind of like braces and biomedical technology, or or you know valves and biomedical technology, um, to even something cool like a like a sidewalk that that could harvest ambient vib vibrations uh, just from people walking over it and, and you know, creating energy just from uh, everyday use of, of people walking on it. Um, and in this case, then, then the, the vibrations we're studying or that I studied in particular, uh, were, were lo longitudinal vibrations along uh, these, uh, these materials will follow the wave equation roughly. And so um, my research considered uh, the wave equation under uh, two different sets of boundary conditions. And so this is representative of the first uh, condition where it would have been um, a Dirac Lake condition uh, such that um, uh, the, the right-hand side is, is clamped um, at a fixed position. That's represented as U zero T uh, is equal to zero. And then the, the left hand is represented as free. Um, this is this modeled by the, the first spatial derivative uh, ux at l being equal to zero for a, uh, a string of length l. Um, the second condition that I looked at was uh, kind of the pure Norman condition. So, so there's uh, at both ends, the, the string is represented as free. Um, and that is that the, the first spatial derivative is equal to zero at both ends. And then um, I'll briefly mention that there was a third uh, kind of boundary condition, which was uh, the clamped at both ends, uh, kind of pure directly uh, condition. I think that um, this was this was solved by Sydney New um, in a, a uh, 498 project, uh, I think the year before mine. I think that, that Emma also kind of addressed this condition in her uh, presentation some. And so, um, why why are we discretizing uh, those those equations that we just saw um, in their in their continuous form as partial differential equations are are explicitly solvable. Um, we can find the eigenvalues for them, and and we'll we'll discuss the eigenvalues for them uh, later in this presentation. But uh, we we have to discretize it um, if we want to be able to um, have like sensors or or actuators. Um, be able to to read the uh, the vibrations along a material or a string, and to like accurately uh, take action and and kind of interpret their measurements. Uh, so so you want you want to be able to um, measure these vibrations at a single point, and you want to be able to characterize uh, everything that's happening along the string uh, with that. And uh, computers that that we use work in finite dimensions, uh, you know, arrays of, of finite dimensions. Which means that that the models that we use with them uh, will have uh, finite dimensions and also have a finite number of, of eigenvalues, um, which is not true for the continuous case um, that you know we kind of saw defined for these. In the in these continuous cases, then you're in infinite dimensions, and you're going to have infinitely infinitely many eigenvalues. 
And so there might wind up being some discrepancies um, between the eigenvalues of our discretized model and the continuous model. And that's what we're going to show. Um, and uh, uh, endless continuing work also show, show that, that that influences the, or impacts the observability of, of these discretized models. So um, the method of, of uh, discretization that I used was, was finite differences. And so um, finite differences, uh, you kind of have like a forward and, and backward finite differences. Um, those look, look very much like kind of like your standard definition of a derivative, except uh, you're not letting that h go to zero. You're, you're keeping them at, at uh, several points. h is your mesh parameter um, or discretization parameter. It's, it's kind of like your step size between your individual nodes. Um, in this case, h is equal to the length of the string divided by um, the number of nodes plus one. And um, we have our, our second derivative here approximation, uh, which we just done by central difference, uh, which is just taking the forwards and then a backwards difference to approximate a second derivative. And so um, using uh, finite differences, we're going to have a semi-discretized wave equation. It's only going we're only going to discretize uh, the spatial component um, like this. And so then we can formulate the wave equation um, in this way. And you'll notice that I, I wrote these uh, boundary conditions here. These, this is representing um, our mixed uh, Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions. And this is, is uh, a pure Neumann at both ends. And I'll show you how we kind of approximated the boundary conditions um, discreetly. So uh, the original kind of boundary condition uh, was was that was that you at the for for the direct lay on the left hand side um, u of zero equal to zero, uh, and that's we're going to kind of say that our state function uh, u naught, uh, which represents the node um, at x equals zero. Is, is identical to zero. So that's how we approximate that one. Um, and then for, for the Neumann conditions, then we used um, for the left-hand side at x equals zero, uh, we approximated this by taking the uh, forward difference between uh, u sub one and, and u sub naught. Um, and so we set that equal to zero. Um, and then since, since h is not equal to zero, then then uh, this implies that u1 equals u0. And then similarly, uh, we used actually a backwards uh, finite difference to approximate um, the normal condition at the other end. And so um, getting into the math and kind of how we, how we approach this problem, then uh, if we, we created a vector with the, with the states um, at each node and, and the time derivatives. And then we can write the wave equation and uh, this is the first order form. And uh, this AH in this case is um, a, a tri-diagonal uh, symmetric matrix. Um, and this kind of contains the, um, if we look back here at our, um, discretization of, of the, the time derivative, those, uh, this matrix contains the coefficients of, of each um, of kind of like the, the nodes, the states of each node. And so you'll notice that, that they're, they're symmetric all the way down, except for the, the first and last lines, uh, because those are, those are influenced by our um, boundary conditions. Uh, so in this case, they both have the same kind of in boundary conditions because they're both Neumann. Um, whereas this one has um, a Neumann condition up here and this one has the direct lay condition on your, uh, for the left-hand sides. So this allows us to, to pose this eigenvalue problem uh, from the, the one above. And so, uh, from the eigenvalue problem, uh, we can obtain the following two equations just from, from matrix multiplication. 
And so uh, using that, then, then we're going to kind of define ourselves a new little problem. Um, so it's an auxiliary problem. Notice that that this lambda tilde squared um, is is in this case being transferred just to lambda. Uh, so we'll solve this kind of system of equations um, uh, by lemma, and then then we'll by theorem apply uh, that back to the original uh, lambda with the tilde. Um, so this uh, negative ah. Uh, psi equals lambda psi um, really forms forms a system of equations uh, where we have all of of uh, uh, you know uh, the spatial discretization written out for for each set of nodes, and we can condense it as follows. Um, and so the the kind of the general solution for these that, that we're going to propose is that psi of k is equal to z to the k. Um, you know, in, in k minus one, you know, for each node, then then you have z to the k, whatever whatever k is for that node. Brian, this is for the clamp free, right? This is, in fact, um, this is this is kind of general. We don't. Okay. Yeah. Okay, you didn't pose any boundary conditions yet. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't. I, think, I think this is for clamped clamp. Um, I don't. It's not particularly. Uh, we will we'll address the boundary conditions uh, here here in a moment. Mm -hmm. We we haven't had to do anything yet where we would have to kind of like substitute them in uh, to figure out our our exact solution. This is kind of like the general uh, form of a solution that we would find for this this type of equation. Um, and just by just by plugging in that that kind of proposed solution, um, and then manipulating a little bit algebraically. Uh, we we can find uh, that there, there's kind of we're going to pose that there's two roots and they're going to have these properties um, such that that z1 times z2 is equal to one so so they're inverses of each other and then also that z1 plus z2 lambda um, is equal to uh, this term right here that formed uh, whenever we were substituting it in um, and so th this property we're going to use to kind of propose uh, this this slightly adjusted form where we have c1 times zk plus c2 times z to the negative k, uh, such that they're, they're inverses. Um, and then this one right here uh, is, is what we're going to use to solve for the eigenvalues um, under each set of boundary conditions. Uh, this is this is kind of like our general solution to the wave equation. And then we're, we're going to use this one to solve under our sets of boundary conditions. And so here is, here's the first lemma, um, and then we'll walk through the proof of it. Uh, this is for the mixed discrete uh, Neumann, uh, oops, I meant to say mixed direct lay Neumann. Um, so that's, that's clamped on the left hand and free on the right hand side. Um, so those are, those are the, the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions that we found. Um, the proof of this, uh, first, we just substituted in our uh, left-hand condition, which is to say that psi of zero equals zero. Um, and from that, we found that C1 must be equal to negative C2. And so we can, we can reformulate um, our general thing to not include C2. We can just write that as negative C1. And then substituting in the left-hand condition that psi of n is equal to psi n plus one. So then we, um, oh, I'm just gonna do some some manipulation here of the variables, and and what we result with is that z to the two n plus one is equal to negative one, and then I I guess I mentioned a little bit that we used a little bit of complex variables, um, so that's that's mostly to say that that we need two n plus one roots of of negative unity of negative one, um, in this case e to the pi i is or e really to the to the 2n plus 1 or 2n minus 1 pi i um, as long as there's an odd integer in front of pi then then you get negative one and so the general form of, of finding roots of negative unity uh, is going to give us this for our z uh, function uh, with j going from 1 to n Plugging that back into our psi, 
then uh, we can we can kind of expand that out uh, using uh, the the, the um, expansion of a v to the pi i. And then we're going to come back to this condition here, uh, and we're going to to use this to solve uh, for for our eigenvalues for this case. Um, which results in, and of course, the eigenvalues that we that we had stated in the lemma. Yeah, if you're not familiar, then then e e to the i theta is equal to cosine of theta um, plus i sine of theta. It's a it's a property that that you might come across in calculus for the younger students here. And so we will do this again uh, for the pure, pure Neumann case, um, where we have Neumann boundary conditions at both sides. And uh, once again, uh, where we start by, by substituting in our boundary conditions um, into each side. In this case, we find that, that C2 is equal to ZC1. Um, that's a little bit cut off. I'm sorry about that. Uh, for the using the left hand side, we find that. And so we can plug that back in uh, to this equation. And once again, we're going to wind up with a similar result after manipulating this. Um, and that's that z to the 2n is equal to 1. So in this case, we are finding, we are finding 2n roots of unity. Um, and so that's going to look something like this. That's kind of like the general uh, form of a solution that we're looking for. If, if, it, if they're going to uh, supply us with, with two in roots of unity. Manipulating this, then we can, we can kind of form the following arguments and then apply this condition uh, to solve for our, our eigenvalues uh, for this case. We can use a lot of the same properties just to transform this into, into a cosine. And then uh, using the trig property to, to finally wind up uh, back with this with this uh, value from of lambda that, that we had in our lemma. Okay, and so kind of like I said, then then we kind of propose those problems with psi um, as a little bit of an auxiliary to uh, the original ones with u, and so the original. Um, Eigenvalues of the of the of our discretized wave equation are the square roots of what we found in the lemma. So round up with plus or minus i um, times the the square root of what we had in the lemma. Uh, with with k and j in this case going from from one to n. Uh, so for each of the nodes. Um, yeah. And so here's here's kind of a comparison um, of uh, the eigenvalues for different ends, and then also in the continuous case. Uh, so down here on the bottom, then we have uh, what we what are the continuous eigenvalues, um, or, or the eigen, eigenvalues of the continuous wave equation uh, with mixed directly Norman conditions, and with pure Norman conditions. Um, I solved for those. I didn't show that. But that, that's something that, um, you know, if you take partial differential equations, uh, then, then, then you'll get familiar with solving the wave equation uh, under continuous conditions. And so the continuous case is in blue here. Um, and you can see, even from these equations, that uh, it is linear in K. Um, and so, uh, you know, at each node, then, then since it's linear, then there's a unit, and since the nodes are evenly spaced with an even space of H, then there's, there's a uniform gap between the nodes. Um, and so, but whenever we look at the eigenvalues of the finite discretized versions, um, then we see that, that they tend to level off. Um, and the eigenvalues were, were sinusoidal, so, so you don't expect them to be linear. But, but since they're leveling off here, um, then what we're, what we're really seeing is that uh, the difference between subsequent eigenvalues is, is getting very close to zero. And so our sensor, whenever it's trying to 
um, differentiate between these, these high frequency eigenvalues, then uh, it won't be able to, to accurately determine uh, what, what kind of the eigenvalue is or, or what, what the structure of the vibrations are along the string um, from its measurement if, if there's high frequency uh, vibrations or high frequency eigenvalues. And so this is, this is a problem um, because you want your sensor to be able to accurately measure uh, the structure of the vibrations. And then here's, here's the gap function, uh, which is kind of illustrates what I was just saying a little bit even, even better, um, which is say that the gap function was defined uh, such that, you know, it's the difference between subsequent eigenvalues or yeah, difference between subsequent eigenvalues. Um, and so you can see that, that, that there's a constant gap for the continuous case, which is again in blue. Whereas um, this is uh, the, uh, the mixed directly Norman case. Um, and it is for n equals 80, I believe. And so you can see that, that as k approaches n, um, or as k goes large or to infinity, then the gap between the eigenvalues tends to go to zero. Um, which again is that, that same problem we were talking about where, where um, our sensor will not be able to, to kind of differentiate between these high frequency nodes up here uh, because they're, they're, uh, the model has them so close together. Uh, about another minute, Brian, yeah. Okay, yeah, so um, this is kind of like the, the final results. Um, Sydney New uh, did this problem for um, the, the pure directly boundary conditions, uh, but, but we found the, the eigenvalues of the discretized wave equation uh, for both the, the mixed directly Neumann and for the pure Neumann uh, conditions. And, and in both cases, then we, we see that the, the eigenvalues of the discrete and the continuous case diverge um, at high frequency as h tends to zero or as, or as n, uh, the number of nodes tends towards infinity. And so, um, yeah, this, this divergence, um, I didn't show this, but, but you actually just heard Emma show that, that this divergence does in fact uh, mean that, that there is a loss of observabil observability um, for the discrete discretized versions, um, which is why she had to, why she, she went forward with applying filtering. Yes, yeah, so this is just saying that the gap between eigenvalues goes to zero as k approaches infinity and h goes to zero. And so conclusions, um, you know, uh, we, we kind of did a spectral analysis of both the continuous and approximated models, uh, looking at their eigenvalues. Um, this work was, was continued by Emma and, and I believe Wilson. Um, we showed that the eigenvalues uh, uh, depend strictly on, on the mesh parameter H. And, and there, we, there, should, there could be more analysis of the limiting case. Um, and uh, the ultimate goal, which was, was uh, of this project, which was, was shown by Emma, was to show that, that observability was not retained um, in the approximated model with that same measurement just at the tip that you can get in the, uh, in the continuous model. Um, and application of filtering techniques Meeks was uh, something that, that we, were, we were hoping would be looked at and, and they were. So I think that's all I have. Does anyone have, have questions for me? All right, thank you, Ryan. Let's all thank Ryan. And we're gonna go Thanks, into some que questions now. Maybe I have questions. Uh, again, put them in the chat, unmute yourself and ask it to them. And I, I guess I can start it off real quick. Um, so, so when you were looking at the the eigenvalues of maybe some different uh, boundary conditions, because I, I read through your senior thesis also, and <laughs> I, I used I, I stole some of your stuff from my presentation too. Nice. <laughs> but uh, so, so when you you've got that uh, matrix, uh, what, what I think you might have called it A H or delta H, something like that. Mm -hmm. I think and, it's called AH. Yeah, you went into uh, guessing the solution for it. So I, my question to you is, why did we 
why did we pick? I think you, we said the we're guessing the solution is z to the k. Z to the k. Um, yeah, so that, that kind of z to the k uh, was done with some foresight. That is, that I think that that is kind of like a general strategy that that can be used in PDEs and stuff because um, a lot of equations can be kind of written as z to the k. In the in the case later that we saw, we wound up seeing uh, you know those those exponential functions. Um, that then wind up getting transformed into uh, kind of like sinusoidal functions. Um, uh, those those come from z to the k, but also in the continuous case, we, we propose a similar solution and we wind up with uh, those kind of like linear eigenvalues. So uh, something that you might kind of see is that, that there's kind of a, that, that z to the k uh, proposed solution is 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 an extremely general uh, thing, and then then from there we we're, we're able to narrow it down uh, to to something that that has uh, a more precise precise feel. We're find, able to find the z. Just to complement, by the way, just to complement, by the way. So when you were doing the continuous case, you were in fact solving a differential equation, mm -hmm. and your your proposed solution was exponential. But now we have a discrete equation, and then the way we solve it, we just first propose a solution in the form that Wilson mentioned, z to the k, and to check if really it is a kind of solution. And in fact, you show that these are the solutions of the discrete equations. So exponential versus uh, z to the k type solutions, essentially, that's what I think Wilson is asking for. Okay. Yeah, so just different solutions we might propose for these are difference equations versus differential equations. Yeah. 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 Uh, it was a key stuff that he did because, you know, some of those results are known, but yeah. there are no proofs of that. <laughs> and we spent a lot of time, in fact, for the pure Neumann case. I, I, as mm -hmm. far as I remember, Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, but pure Neumann case was the one that took the most of the time. At, at some point we got stuck, but mm -hmm. then, uh, I don't know what happened, but we, we, we managed to solve it um, uh, and got the results known in the literature, so. Yeah, yeah, I do remember getting stuck on that. I remember that was also a, uh, that was the, the, the start of the pandemic. So there's kind of yeah. a, <laughs> a time time where it's. <laughs> <laughs> so any other questions for Ryan? Just an observation, um, even though you did start out with this continuous uh, continuous PDE, and then you went to de facto over to this discretized version in the image in a, in a variable Z. Mm -hmm. I mean, in principle, well, in principle, this that discretized equation itself uh, can be mapped over back to a, uh, a continuous domain uh, by way of uh, uh, by way of uh, by way of Laplace transforms mm. where the the uh, the interval the, the the interval term that you have there and your finite difference yep. uh, basically yeah yeah I mean you're, you're familiar with this but I just uh, and in that case, the analysis could be carried out uh, in an image domain of the complex plane. It, it, it's it, it, very good, very very good, uh, very good insight, very good. Tony, that's that's an awesome point. But if you bring that um, eigenvalues graph, Ryan, I can I can show you one thing because that means you're going to the frequency domain when you talk about the Laplace transformation, right? So in the frequency domain, as you see that the eigenvalues diverge away from each other, that's the main issue in, in this research. Like we have the continuous eigenvalues, they're linear, perfect linear, when you take the square root of them. And then there is the eigenvalues of the finite difference, right? And then they flatten out. They, they sort of like diverge away from each other. I think I can type here, hold on. They diverge away from each other, as you see. And if I increase N, th th that's still the case. And that's, that's bad because, you know, when you go back to the gap, uh, picture Ryan. Uh, so the gap gets closer to zero. That means I can't distinguish one signal from another one or one frequency from another frequency when you design your observer. 
So because sensor is gonna read the data based on the finite difference model, but then signals get extremely close to each other. So the sensor cannot say, hey, this is the 39th MOS or this is the 40th MOS. It can't distinguish. That's the, that's the major problem here. Even before we go to the Laplace's uh, transformation and then working with uh, uh, tr the transfer function, I think you're, that's what you're trying to refer to, transfer functions essentially in control theory, we work in the frequency domain. But even yeah. before coming to that, this is the ma major issue here uh, from the control point of view. But that's Excellent a good point. point. Excellent yeah. point. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Um, Thank you. Good talk. Good. Okay. So, again, my, my name is Wilson. I'm doing uh, research with Dr. Oz. We've got a paper we're submitting, I think, next week. And uh, I, I got some of the big. Um, results we got in the paper of uh, the, the very last one. I left out all the technical proofs because I don't think I'm gonna have enough time for that. I got a lot going on here. So, so the title of this is analysis of boundary observability of coupled one dimensional wave equations with mixed boundary conditions. And this is gonna differ from the previous three talks is because now instead of one wave equation, we have two, which makes it significantly harder um, in the analysis. And